to donate his time today, he and Mary, to give us this amazing music. And let's welcome our Marines from Fort Devens, 25th Marine Regiment. So I, I'm just going to say a few words because we had a really busy afternoon today, a lot of things going on. Uh, number one, I just want to let you know, yes, the food is low sodium. That's why we have salt and pepper on the table. Don't blame it on the chef, take it out on me. I did that because we have a lot of people worrying about high blood pressure and all those other good things. So that's what the salt and pepper shakers are for, okay? That's number one. Number two, the raffles. The raffles, all those donations are going strictly to the North Reading Veterans Gift Account to help other veterans out here in the town. So we have a lot of handmade pieces over here, a lot of tons of donations. We get signed autographed footballs and baseball and all kinds of good stuff, handmade jewelry, one of a kind. So all your yellow ones are on the left of you and all pink are on the right. So keep that all in mind. Um, I want to thank my town administrator, Michael Gilberto, for coming. Board of Select, select Board member, Bob Moseri. Representative Jones, Rep and Senator Tarr is supposed to be here, as well as the Secretary to the Department of Veterans Services, Francisco Urena. And let's give a huge applaud for our Lynn English ROTC Marine Corps Cadets under the direction of Captain Castanetti and Sergeant Major Oswald. It's a lot of time to put all these things together, so I've got a lot of people that, and some people that I want to thank for helping me out. Got Kim, I mean, Kim Manzelli over here, Massey Brown running your raffles, Maureen Stevens running your check ins. I have Dottie McAdams over here at table number 14, I believe, and she was been working with me hard to get all everything together for today. I want to thank First Sergeant John Bernard and his lovely wife Sharon for coming down. Four and a half hour drive from Maine. Please stand, John, or wave your hand to be one of our speakers today. And I want to thank everybody here in the audience for coming. This is so great. I actually had 212 responses this year. I've been trying to get to that 200 mark, and we surpassed it. Yay! I'm going to have everybody take their seats, and we're going to start the presentation of our colors. 25th Marine Regiment, Sergeant Esther, Sergeant Bautista, Corporal Rosario, and Lance Corporal Sun. Or is it Corporal Sun then? Corporal Sun? Sorry about that. Okay, if you could all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and for the National Anthem. gentlemen here today to sing our national anthem we have Karen Mullen Karen has a husband who is an Iraq combat veteran out of the 82nd Airborne please give her a round of applause as she makes her way to the dance floor Stripes and 
I'll be seated now. At this time, I'd like to call Captain Castanetti. Um, he is going to present the missing table ceremony, the OW MIA missing table ceremony with his guests. Thank you. Sergeant Major Oswald, hiding in the back, is the one that's responsible for these outstanding cadets. It was 100 years ago, in the spring of 1918, on the battlefields of France. The war-weary Allied armies enthusiastically greeted the American troops arriving at the rate of 10,000 a day at a time when the Germans were unable to replace their losses. The Americans won a victory at Cantini, then again in defensive stands at Chateau Thierry and Belleau Wood. The Americans helped the British Empire and the French and the Portuguese forces defeat and turn back the final German offensive from March to July of 1918. And most importantly, the Americans played a role in the Allied final offensive, the 100 days offensive of August to November. However, many American commanders used the same flawed tactics which the British, French, 
Germans and others had abandoned early in the war. And so many American offensives were not particularly effective. Pershing continued to commit troops to these full frontal attacks, resulting in high casualties against experienced veteran German and Austrian Hungarian units. Nevertheless, the infusion of new and fresh U.S. troops greatly strengthened the Allies' strategic position and boosted morale. The Allies achieved victory over Germany on November 11, 1918, after German morale had collapsed both at home and on the battlefield. Today, 100 years after the end of the war to end all wars, let us remember the 7,470 soldiers, sailors, and Marines from World War I who never returned. Ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention to the center of our gathering. You may have noticed the table set before you. It is filled with symbolism. And I will explain. The table is set for our prisoners of war and those missing in action from all wars. They are not with us today. Their chairs are empty. But save for their hope to return, let us remember their absence. Let us remember the United States Air Force honored by Cadet Furman. Let us remember the United States Army, honored by Cadet Perez. Let us remember the United States Navy, honored by Cadet Tran. Let us remember the United States Marine Corps, honored by Cadet Lopez. And let us remember the United States Coast Guard, honored by Cadet Generazzo. Let us remember the men and women, prisoners of war from all branches of service that are too often forgotten. Let us remember them. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms so that their children could remain free. Remember, the lone candle symbolizes the frailty of a prisoner alone trying to stand up against his oppressors. Remember, The single rose reminds us of the loved ones and families of our comrades in arms who keep the faith and await their return. Remember. A slice of lemon is on the bread plate to remind us of their bitter fate if we do not bring them home. Remember. There is salt on the plate, 
symbolic of the family's tears as they wait and remember. The glasses are inverted. They cannot toast with us tonight, maybe tomorrow, if we remember. The red, white, and blue ribbon is tied to the flower vase by a yellow ribbon that was worn by thousands who awaited their return. Remember. The faded picture on the table is a reminder that they are missed very much and are remembered by their families. Remember. As we look upon this empty table, do not remember ghosts from the past. Remember our comrades. Remember those whom we depended on in battle. They depend on us to bring them home. They will remember what we do. Please honor and remember them. Rivera, I'm sorry, Tavares, extinguishes this candle. Let us transfer its flame to our hearts and remember. Thank you.
Thank you, Deacon. <clears throat> the ladies up the front. Mo, Marcy, Kim. Can we take a seat? Eat? Okay, so they're going to start bringing out the salads, and I believe the rolls and all that good stuff, and we're going to start eating, and then we'll go on to some of our guest speakers. Enjoy your meal. Um, because I am the proud son of a Korean War veteran who unfortunately couldn't be with us here today, uh, he will celebrate his 88th birthday this coming Saturday. Uh, and I think it is... I think it is uh, wonderful that this today is focused on our Korean veterans, obviously all our veterans, but our Korean veterans in particular uh, today, uh, in that oftentimes it is referred to as the Forgotten War. Uh, but recent events have made it clear that it is not a Forgotten War. Just recently this summer, the remains of 55 heroes were brought to Hawaii for identification. In just the past few days, two of those heroes were identified and returned, and will be returned to their families and to their home states. Uh, for internment and recognition. Uh, and that is an important task that we as a country owe to our veterans, to each and every one. Obviously, we celebrate those that came home. We remember those that did not come home. But we have an abiding duty each and every day to make sure that we account for each and every one of those men and women who served our country in battlefields far from our homeland. Uh, and I'm proud to have been uh, able to go to that ceremony. I'm proud to uh, have the POW MIA flag, the first one that was in the state house outside my office, uh, and the chair uh, that recognized those servicemen and women who were still missing in action. And that we as a country and a commonwealth, each and every day, will take steps towards repatriation, identification, and recognition of our veterans uh, and those who paid uh, the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, and just as importantly, I'm very proud to live in a commonwealth that each and every year works towards passing uh, and moving forward legislation that recognize that veterans come home and many times have needs. Uh, and that we need to be about helping and recognizing those veterans who come home uh, and their families, oftentimes, who uh, find themselves in difficult straits. And I want to say that Susan does a fantastic job working with the veterans uh, in our community and surrounding communities to make sure that they get the services they need uh, in interacting with the town government or with state government. Uh, and it's a privilege to work with Senator Bruce Tyre, uh, again, uh, Susan, to make sure that our veterans uh, each and every day are recognized for their service and their sacrifice. And the families of veterans, uh, they, may, they pay a price too. Uh, for time away from family, sometimes they pay uh, with a loved one that never returns. And we need to recognize the service and sacrifice of those families. So it's an honor to be here today with you, uh, to share this meal, uh, to enjoy the afternoon uh, as our first full, full uh, day of fall gets underway. Uh, and I want to thank Susan for all that she does. Thanks again, Susan. Where there are legislators who, to a person, 
are engaged in the belief that we should do everything in our power to support the men and women who have served our country and made sacrifice on so many occasions and their families. And our legislature has a tremendous track record of year after year after year passing legislation that recognizes the importance of doing just that. But those bills and those pieces of legislation which become law are only as good as the people that make contact every day with our veterans to make sure that they have access to the things that are passed and legislated on Beacon Hill. And that's why having good and effective veteran service officers like Susan Magner is so critical to us on Beacon Hill because we need to know that when we put something into law, it will be put into action at the local level. And the person responsible for that at the state level actually just walked into the room, our good friend and veteran, uh, Secretary Francisco Urena, who is uh, a vocal and passionate and effective advocate at the state level as well for making sure that our veterans get the support that they earn and that they deserve and that they need. And so it is an honor to join all of you this afternoon as we have uh, for the last number of years as Susan has gathered us together to think about the importance in our lives of doing whatever we can to show support for veterans. Sometimes something as simple as a handshake or an embrace or a smile with the word thank you when you see someone on the street that you know has put on the uniform of our country raised their right hand and sworn an oath to defend the things that make us the greatest nation on the face of this earth. And so it is wonderful to be able to spend a little bit of time reflecting on the importance of that legacy and reflecting on the importance of those who continue to serve us today. And in that category, I would include uh, the young men and women from the JROTC and the ROTC that are with us today that remind us that the importance of that legacy is not lost on the current generation, and they continue to lead and stand ready, willing, and able to defend the values that we all share in this country. This afternoon, I know that there's going to be a special recognition for those uh, in the Korean War. And as Brad made reference to, uh, that war has been called the Forgotten War. And I would suggest to you that it is a shame on us as a country if we ever let any war, any veteran, any service, anywhere ever be referred to as forgotten. But it is never too late to say thank you to a veteran. Never too late to recognize the service that they have rendered so that we can engage in the pursuit of our own lives in freedom and liberty and with justice for all. And how fitting is it at this time that we get gathered together to think about those who served in Korea. We know how difficult that service was. We know how difficult the climate could be. We know how difficult the conditions could be. We know how difficult the mission could be. But let it never be forgotten that that was an important time for people to step up and stand up and confront hostility and aggression on the Korean Peninsula. And we think about today all the things that we see in the newspaper, on the radio and television that are possible, that there may actually be freedom and unity on the Korean Peninsula, something that people have dreamed about for decades. And yet, where would we have been if America, and its bravest and most courageous, didn't stand up to that hostile aggressor? That dream would never be possible, and we wouldn't be reading those things and being inspired to think about a better day for those people. Because in the end, that's what America is all about. It's about having freedom and justice and liberty, not only for us, but the great dream that we have that one day people all over this world will have those things in common with us. We couldn't dream that dream either without the people who have served us and those who continue to serve. And that's why it's important 
that on the first day of fall, as the leaves may be falling, our spirits are rising to say thank you. We will never forget your service. We are committed to doing everything we can to be supportive and encouraging and appreciative. And may God bless those who have served, who continue to serve, the families who make the sacrifice with them, and these United States of America. I think the food is ready. Thank you very much. established a line of demarcation at the 38th parallel on the Korean Peninsula. 
The line served to establish areas of control by both the Russian and U.S. governments following the close of World War II. That decision divided the Korean people, angered Chairman Mao Zedong and neighboring China, and helped forge an uneasy alliance between China, what was now North Korea, and an expansionist Russia. China was zealous to increase its influence in the region, which included a 1948 incursion into the British-held territory of Malay, referred to as the, Mal the Malayan Emergency, and the French-held territory of Indochina. Later, we, we adopted that uh, literally on the heels of Korea, and it became known as the Vietnam War. Russia, for its part, was still seeking a warm, warm water seaport as it had its entire existence and had become the great opportunist of the post-World War II realignment and, and agreed to support North Korea and China as a way to achieve that age-old goal. And so it was that the relative calm following the signing of the surrender aboard the deck of the USS Missouri on September 2nd, 1945, was shattered with the preparatory fires from North Korean artillery, followed by an invasion by some 100,000 North Korean troops crossing the 38th parallel on June 25th, 1950. Within days of the UN, excuse me, within days, the UN had issued Resolution 83, authorizing the use of force by member states as they coalesced and came to the aid of South Korea. By September, the UN reinforced South Korean army had been pushed south to the port city of Busan with the remnants of that 100,000 North Korean force pounding away at what was now called the Busan perimeter. In an attempt to thwart the efforts of the invaders, a decision was made to cut off the North Korean invasion force with an, invasion, an amphibious landing at Incheon, which caused the North Korean force to splinter and retreat, liberating Seoul and the beleaguered UN coalition. What followed is some of the most intense battle scenarios ever encountered in modern warfare, which are recounted in history books and military academies and which shine attention on the names of men who are to this day lauded as the finest warriors this nation ever produced. And there is no single battle in the entire war that is quite as storied as the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir. The regrouped UN force, made up largely of U.S. Army and Marine Corps ground troops and close air support, exploited the gains made at Incheon and pushed north to the Yalu River on the Chinese border. Intelligence had been telling General MacArthur for quite some time that Chinese regulars were massing on the border and preparing for an incursion into Korea. But MacArthur was not convinced and discounted the reports out of hand as they pushed forward with their effort, effort to trap the North Korean forces in a classic pincer maneuver at the southern head of the Tybek mountain range that runs north-south through the peninsula like a spine. This plan placed the 8th Army on the offense, moving north on the west side of the Tybek mountain range, and the 7th Army Division on the east side of the Chosen Reservoir, and the Marine Corps' 1st Division making its way north along the east side of the Tybek mountain range, having just made an amphibious landing at Wonsan. The plan was simple. Preposition the 8th Army and swing the, the 1st Marine Division into position to their east near Hagaruri on the south of the reservoir and catch the withering North Korean force in between. The 7th Army Division would serve to prevent stragglers of the North Korean force from escaping. What MacArthur did not count on was the very thing he had been warned of as an estimated 50,000 Chinese poured across the border and assaulted the 8th Army. The attack was so overwhelming it forced the 8th Army into full retreat. Meanwhile, the 1st Marine Division had been making its way north toward the Chosen Reservoir, but at a pace far slower than MacArthur had wanted. General Oliver, Oliver P. Smith was convinced the Chinese were already in country and made substantial preparations for a protracted, bounding fight against the Chinese. On 10 November 1950, Marine Corps birthday, by the way, Smith's suspicions were legitimized as the entire 1st Marine Division, now just south of Hagaruri, at the southern point of the reservoir and the Army 7th Division were attacked and surrounded by an estimated 120,000 Chinese PVA forces. What followed in the next 17 days of fighting has been described as the most successful retrograde maneuver in the annals of warfare. By the time the Marine Corps 1st Division and the few survivors from the 7th Division had made their way to the extraction point at Hung Nam, an estimated 80,000 Chinese had died in combat and the effects of the minus 35 degree weather that they were fighting in. An additional 1,100 Marines were killed and another 5,000 suffered cold weather injuries and the 7th Division was nearly destroyed and the 8th Army on the other side of the Tybek Mountain had pushed back to its pre-launch position. 
Fighting would continue in Korea for three more years before both sides would agree to a cessation of hostilities and the establishment of the 38th parallel of a demilitarized zone on 27 July 1953, which also serves as the border between North and South Korea today. The Korean War in urban vernacular is referred to as the Forgotten War. I cannot imagine a more insulting name for any war or any battle or any war fighter in which so many fought and died to establish even a tentative peace. By the end of the Korean War, the death toll is recorded this way. U.S. casualties, 36,574. Wounded, 103,284. Medals of Honor, U.S. Air Force, four. U.S. Army, 92. U.S. Marine Corps, 42. U.S. Navy, seven. I just want to impress the point. They don't hand out the, uh, the Medal of Honor uh, for stubbing your toe. Uh, the, the Medal of Honor is the highest award that any man or woman would ever receive in this nation in combat. And you've got nearly 135 medals that were awarded during this very short war. South and North Korean and Chinese casualties, 2,823,000. This war should never be forgotten. Nor the names of battles where, battles where men fought and died keeping to their roles to secure the Constitution, the nation it defines, the people who populate it, and their fellow war fighters. Names like Hagaru Ri, Koto Ri, Yudan Ni, Hung Nan, Nudong Ni, Hellfire Valley, East Hill, Heartbreak Ridge, Hill 282, White Horse, Nak Tong, Hook, Bloody Ridge, Chosin, and men who fought there, Puller, Drysdale, Faith, Smith, Almond, MacArthur, Barr, Barber, Bow, Champagne, Davis, Gillen, Sitter, and Windridge. Let their names never be forgotten that our children's children should grow old with the memory of these names as well as the bloodstained emblazoned, bloodstained places emblazoned in their memories. That both the sacrifice and the reasons for it should never slip from our national consciousness and that the knowledge would inform future generations of the cost of war and of power and most importantly, of the freedom that they bring. There is no forgotten war, just shallow memories. Let us never forget our wars, certainly not those who have sacrificed so much. Thank you. Thank you, Brother John. Next, I'd like to call up Secretary to the Department of Veterans Services, Francisco Urena. Francisco Urena was sworn in as Secretary of the Department of Veterans Services by Governor Charlie Baker on February 6, 2015. Secretary Urena's commitment to government service began the day after graduating high school when he enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. In the span of eight years of honorable service, his duties included diplomatic security with the Department of State at two American embassies, American Embassy Damascus in Syria and American Embassy, I'm going to mess up this name, Bishkek. I did it go okay? He's a Purple Heart recipient from injuries sustained during Operation Iraqi Freedom Campaign. Veteran service officer, he was a veteran service officer for the city of Lawrence and later as a commissioner of veteran services for the city of Boston in 2008. Francisco Urena was honored with Veteran Service Officer of the Year, awarded by former Veteran Separ Services Secretary Thomas G. Kelly. Please give a round, a warm round of applause for Secretary Urena. Thank you, Susan. And let's give a round of applause to Susan and the rest of the members of the committee that placed this great event together. Thank you, and good afternoon to each and every one of you all. In the same spirit of as we're thanking folks, let's also give a, a great hand to our waiting staff today who delivered a beautiful meal. Yeah, 
out to our, our colleagues in the legislature, to Senator Tarr and to Representative Jones, thank you for your commitment to, to our veterans. I think you both captured that beautifully. Governor Charlie Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, and 365,000 veterans who call Massachusetts home. It is a true privilege to lead this department, a leader among our nation, in the way and in the manner in which we deliver the benefits and services. And those that aspect happens locally, with a veteran service officer in every city and town, as mandated by our laws here in Massachusetts. Laws that date back 100 years before the VA federally was even established. Again, it goes to our history as uh, one of the older states. But it also goes to predecessors in the legislature who thought it was important enough to care for those wounded and maimed in wars. Wars such as that of the Revolution, the French and Indian War, before our country was established to ensure that the widows who were left behind were not burdened by that loss any more than the loss of their husbands at the time. And now men and women continue to serve in commitments in the legislature with welcome home bonuses as, as a minimum, as an aspect of a welcoming conversation, continue to happen. The benefits, the services, the safety net program, the Susan and the, less, and the rest of her colleagues across the Commonwealth and every community continue to be strong. And it is something that we continue to provide more emphasis, more support. And now for the last three years, we not only trained the veteran service officers so that they have a great play, playing field of knowledge, but also certify them so that they carry that certification and are, have that sense of value that they are all known for. And it is leaders like these that share the very best. This is not a benefits fair, this is not an, an aspect of outreach, but it's an aspect of members of the community who wanted to come together, place a, a meal, just to thank our veterans. And it is events like these that make Massachusetts a great place of neighborhood, community, and great people caring for our veterans. You know, I know that we've talked about our Korean War veterans, and before I touch a little more upon you all, I know that we also have some World War II veterans here in the audience, and if they can, please rise. I know one gentleman's in the back, and let's get these, this gentleman and if any other World War II veterans among us a great round of applause. And to our Vietnam and our Korean War veterans, you know, when both of your generations came home, our country did not give you the ticker tape parades that our World War II veterans received. And it was just a, a nature of, of society. The wars were politicized, the, your timing, you did not return back as a unit, maybe as a single unit, as a single individual. And so to our Korean and our Vietnam veterans, today and every day, let me tell you, thank you and welcome home. And let's give you a great round of applause. Representative Jones, we're with the Korean Consul General to New England at a Korean medal presentation that the Korean government places together. They talked about General MacArthur. They talked about the sacrifices of so many who stood the line. And each American who served in Korea is revered as a national hero in Korea because your sacrifices continue to ensure that the liberties that the Republic of Korea has is attested to your sacrifice and those that did not make it home. So to our Korean War veterans here today, thank you. To our Vietnam veterans, thank you for your, your passion and perseverance of returning back into an aspect when our society was perhaps not ready. And so to our most honorable and probably least honored veterans, our Vietnam veterans, we, today and every day, we thank you. And over the last three years, that has been our focus to ensure we continue to identify Vietnam veterans. Because of that aspect of that disconnect that you all had upon return home, many benefits that you all have earned have remained at the table. Benefits such as 
the ability to walk to a VA healthcare clinic or a hospital, and that lack of trust that you may have had, and know that many changes have been made and continue to be made to ensure that we can do more for you and that you don't feel that your service did not dignify the aspect of those benefits. I know that we have some active duty military here and to the Marines and the audience, Semper Fi. Welcome, thank you. Whether you are in uniform or not, I know there's a couple of Marines here on leave, one specifically I saw. Um, though they represent the 1% of our country, 1% of our population that continues to wear the uniform of our nation in the active duty military. And to the men who follow the, the examples of the men and women uh, who have served, thank you. Uh, both men and women wear and continue to go into the military following the traditions that many men and women here have set. And I thank you all for your commitment. I thank you all for your service and sacrifice to you and, and that specifically to of your families. And finally, let me leave you with a sense of a focus that our administration has on behalf of Governor Baker, and Lieutenant Governor Polito, to continue to focus on the constant outreach that we owe all of our populations of veterans. The aspect of access into communities, the aspect of trust that veterans need to continue to have, and that aspect happens locally. And I can't tell you enough of what our veteran service officers do. They go out of their way. It's not just a nine to five job on Monday through Friday, here we are on a Sunday. And that focus is something that veteran service officers have a passion for. But these offices are not just for veterans. See, if you haven't served and you want to make a commitment and you want to be able to help, knock on the door of a veteran service officer, place a call. There is an opportunity for you to give back. There is an opportunity for you to get involved. It is not just a Veterans Day or a Memorial Day ceremony. It's specifically to our youth, service projects, opportunities for volunteering, that sense of connection between those who served and those who haven't still exists, and it, and it exists locally with the offices of Veteran Services. And more importantly, to those who, who are here from Lynn, Lynn English High School, our JROGC unit, who happen to be the youngest uh, crew here today, I want to make a quick social experiment, and I know that our, our Korean War veterans are here. And so our Korean War and our World War II veterans, you probably remember in your youth or your younger days being among World War I veterans, show of hands, that's probably true, probably some Civil War veterans. And so that aspect and that connection that you all have as youth to get involved and, and share those stories of our Korean War veterans and our World War II veterans, they'll miss that opportunity. There'll be a time here in the future when these great generations will not be no longer among us. And it is our role to ensure that we do as much for you as much as we can to preserve their stories so that those stories can become your sense of experiences. So thank you so very much, Susan, once again, for once a beautiful meal beautiful evening and an opportunity to recognize those who have borne the battle, worn the uniform, and stood to defend and protect our nation. To all of us who are here in, in that sense of support, thank you for continuing to recognize and continuing to honor. And that's what makes communities such as North Reading a very special place. Thank you very much. U.S. Army. Bill Post, United States Marine Corps. Hurrah! U.S. Navy, Dental Club. I've been going on. Billy! You get that? Should I say it loud? U.S. Navy, Minnesota. Roy Wall was U.S. Army! Vincent Sabella, United States Army. Korean War. U.S. Air Force. Infantry Army Career. 
Hey, this is a lot more than four. Yeah, you you want to
want to call Sergeant Major Oswald to the stand. to 7.30 every morning, Monday through Friday, three hours on weekends, Saturday from 7 o'clock until 11, and they are busy every weekend. So with that, Edward Perez, hit it.
空気に入れて。